It's a privilege to be with you all this morning as we open God's Word together. You can go ahead and start making your way to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Last week, we began this new series by looking at the greeting of this letter, which is found in the first uh, two verses. So today we're going to look at the, the next few verses, which make up the opening lines of the main body of the letter. So the greeting had the uh, introduction of who is writing and who's being written to. But starting in verse 3, Peter, the apostle, gets to the, the body of what he intends to say to these Christians. And what is striking about where the letter begins is that even though this is a letter that will have a lot to say about Christian suffering, it begins with praise. So this letter, of which one of the great themes is persecution and suffering in Jesus' name, It opens with a burst of praise, praise to God for his kindness, and it's really an invitation to the readers to join Peter in praising God for his kindness. And I think that this opening burst of praise is not just a flowery, pious Formality, I think that Peter is giving us in these verses a foundational conviction that we need if we're going to be faithful exiles. So you may recall from last week, and you can see for yourself in verse 1, Peter addresses these Christians as elect exiles. So Christians, by definition, are people who are not at home in this world, in this fallen age. And being people who are not at home in this world, there are certain losses that come along with that. Those losses can be as severe as major persecution and even martyrdom, And those losses can be as subtle as ridicule and a loss of social status. But regardless, all Christians exist in this world as people who are not at home. And so the the question is, will we be faithful exiles? That is one of the burdens, one of the goals of this letter is to instruct Christians who are experiencing a measure of loss because of their status as exiles, he's going to instruct them in how to be faithful. Because faithful exiles, uh, they don't compromise under pressure. Uh, Faithful exiles, they don't get revenge on their persecutors. Faithful exiles, they don't turn on each other when the heat of persecution grows. Faithful exiles, they don't expect to live an easy, suffering-free life. And all of these things Peter will get to in the course of his letter. But again, today, he starts with this bedrock conviction that faithful exiles must have. This is a truth that needs to get down into our souls, into our bones, into our gut, so that we can go out into the world and not just be exiles, begrudgingly, reluctantly, but faithfully. So let's read what he has to say. We're going to look at 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. This is God's Word. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we receive this as what it truly is, your very word, spoken through your servant Peter, and now read in our hearing. Would you give us eyes to see what is here? Would you give us hearts that are open to your encouragement and your challenge and your strengthening work? Uh, We ask that you would be active by your Holy Spirit in these very moments as we consider these words of Peter. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's the bedrock conviction that this text puts in front of us, calls us to make our own. Christians can be faithful exiles because... God has given us a better home. Christians can be faithful exiles in this world where we're not at home because God truly has given us a better one. And we see this conviction as it's celebrated in this text. We see it arise from four connected truths. So I want to work through these verses, looking at these four connected truths that together show us that Christians can be faithful exiles in this world because God has given us a better home. So truth number one. Truth number one is God has remade us. God has remade us. You can see this in verse 3. So first, Peter says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That word blessed just means, in this context, praised. He's saying, may God be praised. May God be well spoken of for the things he has done. And then he begins to describe what God has done, that the things that make him worthy of our praise. And look at where he starts. In the middle of verse 3. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. We'll stop there for now. According to his great mercy, God the Father has caused us, that is Christians, believers in Jesus, to be born again. So this is referring to a reality that theologians refer to as regeneration. Regeneration, the new birth, being born again. And what regeneration is, it's simply an act of God in which he transforms a person in such a way that he or she now has the capacity to embrace Jesus Christ with real faith and repentance. That's regeneration. It's being transformed by God in such a way that we now have the spiritual capacity to embrace Jesus Christ. Regeneration or the new birth or being born again, it it describes the way that God takes people who are spiritually dead and makes them spiritually alive. Listen to how uh, theologian John Murray describes regeneration. Murray writes, God effects a change which is radical and all-pervasive. A change which cannot be explained in terms of any combination, permutation, or accumulation of human resources. Regeneration is a change which is nothing less than a new creation. So a Christian is not someone who has just decided to turn over a new leaf 
and try a bit harder or, or give this Jesus thing a try. A Christian, by the biblical definition, is someone who has been made new. They've been brought back to life. They have a spiritual capacity and vitality that they did not previously have. Notice as well the basis for this act of God. What does it say in verse 3? This is according to or, or in line with his great mercy. God's mercy is his compassion for people who are in misery. So notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that God's causing us to be born again was done according to our righteousness. It doesn't say God caused us to be born again uh, according to our earnest desire to be born again. At the, at the root of our spiritual life and faith in Christ, if you go down to the bottom, what you find is the mercy of God. God saved us. God gave us new hearts and new life out of his overflowing compassion, his mercy, his kindness for sinners like us. So that's the first truth. And in fact, the way that this sentence is put together, everything that follows that statement that God has caused us to be born again, everything that follows now is going to unpack different aspects of what that means. So our first truth of the four that we're covering from this passage is that God has remade us. The next three truths are all phrases from the following verses that are attached to that statement and show us some of the implications, some of the aspects of this reality. So truth number one is God has remade us. Truth number two is that God has remade us with a future. God has remade us with a future. This is still in verse three. So God has caused us to be born again. Look at the very next phrase. To a living hope. So we've been born again, made new, given new life. So that, with the result that, we now have what Peter describes as a living hope. So what is hope? Hope in this sense, in this context, means the the confident anticipation of a future good. It's the confident anticipation of a future good. Uh, I can think of few forms of anticipation that were as intense and joy-filled as being a kid waiting for Christmas. When I think back to like memories of Christmas, the, the anticipation is as vibrant of an emotional memory as the joy of Christmas itself. Because I can remember just the the counting down of the days, the imagining of what the Christmas season will be like, imagining what Christmas Day will be like. There was no uncertainty as to whether or not Christmas Day would come. My anticipation was the eager longing for something that I knew was coming. It was simply a matter of time. How long will I have to wait for Christmas to come? And that's the kind of hope that Peter's describing. Not just a, man, it would be great if this happens, but a confident expectation for a future good that is coming. And he puts an adjective on that. What does he call it? A living hope. And I think this just underscores, underlines the fact that this hope is valid. It's living in the sense that the thing we're anticipating really is coming. It really will take place. It's a living hope as opposed to a dead or a vain or a futile hope, a hope that ultimately will let you down. 
the Christian hope, the hope into which the Christian has been remade to possess is a living hope. It's valid. It's really there. I think a lot of people today would agree that hope is a good thing. There may have been periods in the past where maybe hope uh, seems sort of intellectually childish, you know, like the grown-up way to view life is that it's just all darkness and misery and chaos and you just better face it. It seems to me, I could be wrong, and certainly people still think that way, but in our sort of therapeutic post-truth age, I think hope has made kind of a comeback uh, in this sense that, well, I just saw that the uh, School of Public Health at Harvard a few years ago, they uh, did a study and, and it showed that there seems to be some correlation between having an optimistic outlook and living longer. So the idea was and is that hope is good for you. You're more likely not to die young if you have some sense of hope. The issue, though, is that Peter is not just talking about a general, hopeful optimism. Like, Christianity is not interested in offering the world a therapeutic, general hopefulness, as if we have but one of many possible ways to get by and live a little bit longer with some hope. What matters to Peter, what mattered to all the apostles and all the early Christians, and what has mattered to all Christians throughout history for centuries is that the thing we are putting our hope in is real. It is actually coming. We've been remade with a future. God has remade us. Truth number one, God has remade us specifically with a future. That's truth number two. Now, truth number three, God has remade us through the resurrection of Jesus. God has remade us through the resurrection of Jesus. So truth number two says something about the outcome of being regenerated, that we possess this new capacity to have a real valid hope. Truth number three now is saying something about the means by which God has made us new. So look at verse three. He's caused us to be born again to a living hope. Look at the next phrase now. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So the means by which God has made spiritually dead people alive is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So this, of course, is referring in a very compact way to the central event and events of the Christian faith, that Jesus of Nazareth was executed on a Roman cross And three days later, he was raised from the dead. He left his own grave. Now, this wasn't the first time that someone who had been dead was brought back to life. But what was different with Jesus is that he was not merely restored to a mortal life. If you think about someone like Lazarus, Lazarus was brought back from the dead by Jesus himself but he was brought back to the same kind of life he had before, meaning he was still a mere mortal. He died at some point later on. What the New Testament makes very clear about Jesus' resurrection is that it was different in the sense that the, the kind of life that he now possessed after his resurrection was an eternal life, an indestructible life. He died, I'm sorry, he was raised never to die again. So he possesses a kind of resurrection life that is different than Lazarus or any other of the few people that were brought back to life. And there's something else that's different about Jesus' resurrection. And this Peter actually is referring to here. Because of who Jesus is 
as the the new Adam, as the, the king of God's people, his resurrection counts for us. Or, or another way to say that, it, it accomplishes something that becomes available to other people. The resurrection of Jesus is not like, uh, you know, a Houdini escape where we look at it and marvel and go, wow, that's amazing that he could do that. Wow, Jesus got out of the grave. No, no, no. Jesus' resurrection throws open the door for people to leave the prison of death. His resurrection becomes the means by which we actually escape death ourselves. Regeneration, which Peter just mentioned, is a kind of new creation. It's a little like drop of new creation that drops into the middle of history and and makes a person part of the new creation. Well, the resurrection of Jesus is like the opening of the floodgates of the new creation. When Jesus was raised, the new creation, in a very real sense, dawned. It began. It it broke into this death-ridden world. Now, it's not fully here yet, as we're seeing even in this passage, but through the resurrection of Jesus, the new creation begins. You could picture it like a sunrise. A sunrise is the beginning of the daytime. So if the daytime is the new creation, bringing an end to the night of death and sin and alienation from God, the resurrection of Jesus is like the first glimmers of dawn that just break across the horizon. And regeneration is like an individual being awakened from their spiritual oblivion. And what Peter is saying is that the way that God the Father wakes somebody up to make them a new creation is he wakes them up with the light of the resurrection, with the glimmer of dawn that Jesus' resurrection is. And, And it's not merely the case, when I use that analogy, it's not merely the case that a a person contemplates the resurrection as a concept and then decides to believe in it, although that is part of the process. What Peter is saying is that the resurrection power of Jesus' victory over death is the same power that wakes us up, that gives us the capacity to believe in the resurrection. We are made new, Peter says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what that means for the the argument that he's making is it shows how our status as reborn new creations is rooted, it's, it's grounded in the same reality that the future new creation is also grounded in. In other words, the reason that you and I are born again is because Jesus is alive. It's his resurrection that has made us born again. And so that also shows us why our hope is living rather than in vain because Jesus' resurrection is the grounds for not only our regeneration, our new spiritual life. It's also the grounds and the guarantee for the final full unveiling of the new creation. So, God has remade us. Truth number one. Truth number two, God has remade us with a future. Truth number three, God has remade us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, truth number four. God has remade us for an inheritance. He has remade us for an inheritance. So this is in verse four and verse five. So again, the sentence continues. This is still building on that main phrase that he has caused us to be born again. Look at where it picks up in verse four. 
He's caused us to be born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So here we have another result of our regeneration. The first result, which is related to this one, the first result was that we have a hope. We have a living hope. We have a real future that we now anticipate. Then he talked about the means, how we got this new life. Now he's coming back to another result. And the other result is that we possess, even now, an inheritance. Now what does that mean? When we hear the word inheritance in our society, we think of cash or maybe like a portfolio of different assets. In this day, the main category of inheritance that most people would have known about or experienced would be land. You would inherit land, which was also the main form of of wealth. And even more relevant, I think, to what Peter's getting at is that when you look at the Old Testament, one of the main ways that the land of Israel, the promised land, one of the main ways that the Old Testament describes that is as an inheritance. Again and again, God will refer in the Old Testament to the land that I gave you as an inheritance. And so what I think Peter is doing here by talking about inheritance, I don't think this is merely or even mainly a a metaphor, as if inheritance is like a handy word picture for some other spiritual reality, like maybe salvation. Uh, There's a sense in which that could be true as well. But what I think Peter is driving at is that our inheritance is our stake In the kingdom of God. Or I could put it a slightly different way. Being heirs to this inheritance means we have a place in God's dwelling place. So God's kingdom, if we could take a step back and and consider this bigger category. God's kingdom most simply is God's people in God's place under God's rule. God's people living in God's place, enjoying God's reign or rule. In the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, the place part of the kingdom of God was mainly the land, centered on the temple in Jerusalem, but the promised land was the place where God promised to dwell with his people. What happens as you move to the New Testament, it's not so much that God says, I don't really care about land anymore, that's not important, now it's just all spiritual. What I think actually happens as you move from the Old Testament to the New Testament is the place of God's dwelling expands to include the whole earth. And as it turns out, it's a restored earth at that. In in other words, the, the promise of a place for God's people to dwell with him, the way that's fulfilled is not with a particular like patch of real estate, but rather with a new creation. That what history is moving towards is the restoration of all things so that the whole earth becomes a new heaven and a new earth where God dwells with God's people and they enjoy his reign. So coming back to 1 Peter 1.4, what I'm saying is that to be an heir of the inherit- in that inheritance is to have a stake, to have a promised, guaranteed place in that coming new creation. So, what does Peter say about this inheritance? He actually describes it quite a bit. Notice, first of all, it's eternal. Look at verse 4. This inheritance is imperishable, it's undefiled, and it's unfading. These are all different ways of saying It's never going to spoil. It's never going to go bad. It's never going to be lost. It will last forever, which is, of course, in stark contrast to any kind of inheritance that we could have in this life, in this age, in this world. So it's eternal. Notice, secondly, that this inheritance, verse 4 goes on to say, is kept in heaven for you. 
This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Now, heaven, what does that mean? Heaven, uh, it can refer to just the sky, but when it's used like this, it usually means rather than the literal like sky above us, it means the spiritual realm where God dwells and reigns. The spiritual realm where God dwells and reigns. And one of the ways that the book of Revelation pictures the arrival of the new creation, it pictures it as heaven coming down and merging with earth. That's one way of conceptualizing what is the new creation. It's God's invisible spiritual realm coming down and remaking this realm so that it is his very dwelling place. And the reason I bring that up is we sometimes think of our hope or our inheritance as merely uh, our souls going to heaven when we die. And that is true. That it is a great comfort as Christians to know that when our lives on earth end, we go spiritually to be with the Lord. But I don't think that Peter here is talking about that and saying that's where your inheritance is, and so as soon as you die, you get your inheritance. I think rather what he's saying is that the inheritance is kept there. That is where the kingdom of God is most intensely present, is in the heavenly realms. But our inheritance, our coming into possession of that inheritance, will only happen when Jesus returns, and heaven comes down, and the earth is restored, and we have a new heaven and a new earth. So the point here in verse 4 is not that you get your inheritance when you die and go to heaven, but that God is keeping it safe for that great and final day when heaven will come down and merge with earth. So it's eternal. It's kept in heaven for you. Notice third, the other thing that Peter highlights about our inheritance is he says that we as heirs, we ourselves are guarded for our final salvation. Look at verse 5. So it's kept in heaven for you, and now this is describing you, Christians, you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It's a powerful statement. It's a powerful, comforting, beautiful statement that God himself is guarding us, not just for a time, but he's guarding us all the way until that day when our salvation is ready to be revealed. And I think what that's talking about is our final rescue from all of the effects of sin and the fall, which is to say our day of coming into possession of our inheritance. God guards us all the way. His power guards us all the way until that day. But notice there's another phrase that's in the mix here. God guards us with his power through faith. So God's power is guarding us, but also in some sense our faith is a means through which God's power guards us. What I think that this is referring to, what this is talking about, is what has come to be known as the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Uh, This is something that uh, the Reformed tradition has has highlighted and championed, and and in my view, this is a, a biblical understanding of how this works. And what this means when I say the perseverance of the saints, what I mean is that all true believers will persevere until the end which has two parts to it, and they're both reflected in this verse. The first part is that no true believer will ever lose their salvation. That's the first part. The second part, though, is that all true believers will keep on trusting in Jesus. And you see both of those in verse 5, because it's the very power of God that guards us, so how could he lose us? But it's also through faith that God guards us. That's the perseverance of the saints. Now, the reason why I bring this up is that there are Christians, there are views that say, on the one hand, that you can become a real Christian 
and subsequently lose your salvation. And on the other hand, there are views that say, there are Christians that teach that once you become a Christian, you cannot lose your salvation, but you are still a Christian even if you abandon your faith in Jesus. That you're so eternally secure that even if you apostatize and you walk away and you abandon Jesus and you stop following him, if you made a profession of faith, you're still saved, period. The, the reformed doctrine of the perseverance of the saints says to the first view, there's no way a true believer can be lost. God's power guards us to the end. The doctrine of the perseverance of the saints says to the second view that no one is truly a believer who does not persevere. By not persevering, they show themselves to not have been a genuine Christian. Now, I bring this up uh, with one important caveat or qualification, which is if, if you hold either of those other two views, uh, you can be a member here. We're not trying to like say everybody has to agree with this, but you will hear the reformed understanding of the perseverance of the saints taught in this church. And it's because of verses like 1 Peter 1, 5. In my estimation, it's hard to square either of those other two views with this verse not to mention the many other verses that I think support this view. Okay, let's come back to the argument that Peter's making. Why does he go into such detail? Well, obviously, he's emphasizing, underlining, underscoring how unshakable our inheritance is. That we have this stake. We have a, a home that is safe and secure, and it is safe. It is unshakable. It cannot be lost. It cannot be corrupted. We cannot be lost because God is keeping us. And so he's highlighting how sure our inheritance is. So God has remade us. God has remade us with a future. He's remade us through the resurrection of Jesus. And he's remade us for an inheritance. And if we, if we put these four things together and we consider them in the context of what Peter goes on to say, I think it is a fair summary to say that Christians can be faithful exiles because we have a better home. And what I think Peter will go on to show us in this letter is that if we will embrace and believe that about ourselves, that we really have a better home, that it really is there, it really is coming, it will radically transform our lives. It will make us into increasingly faithful exiles. So what does this look like? How does it actually change you to be more confident that you actually have a better home that's there and it's coming? Let me try to summarize some ideas for living this out by trying to respond to two objections. So I'm going to give two objections and in trying to respond to the objections, I'm hoping to give you some ideas on how this actually gets traction in our lives. Okay? So here's objection number one. The first objection that someone might have to living your life on the basis of what Peter says here is this. If you put all your hope in a future world, won't that remove every incentive to make this world a better place? If you put all your hope in a world that's coming, that's future, that's not here, doesn't that make you the kind of person who has zero interest in what's happening right here in this world? It's an old objection. It's a common objection. And I think it's common and old because it has a certain kind of logic to it. Why, why do we care about this world? Why does having a future better home actually make us better citizens now? How do we respond and think about this objection? Well, I think the, the objection misconstrues something very fundamental about the hope of the gospel. You see, the objection assumes that the Christian hope is kind of like an escape pod from a doomed spaceship, or it's like a life raft from a sinking 
ocean liner. Like once you have your spot on the pod or the life raft, you're good. Like who cares about the sinking ocean liner or the doomed spacecraft? You got your escape. You got your ticket to somewhere better. I think a better analogy, there are probably lots of better analogies, but, but here's one analogy that I think better captures the, the full framework of the Christian hope. The Christian hope, the hope of the gospel, is more like a radio message transmitted to a small unit of soldiers, outnumbered and surrounded by the enemy, and the message to them is, help is on the way, victory is certain, hold on and fight hard. That's a very different message than here's an escape hatch that gets you out. The message is help is coming, victory is certain, hold on and fight hard. In other words, the hope of a new creation, of a better home, is meant to reorient the way we do life here. It's not meant to cause us to turn our back on life here and walk away. Most of you have probably heard of Frederick Douglass. He was a famous uh, leading abolitionist of the 19th century. Uh, Incredible guy, incredible life. He was actually converted to faith in Christ while he was still enslaved. And of course, his story is that he he escaped from slavery, uh, self-educated, and became uh, a leading abolitionist speaker and, and leader. This is what he says about how his outlook changed after his conversion. So he's still enslaved. He, he comes to faith in Christ and he describes it years later like this. Douglas writes, after this, I saw the world in a new light. I seemed to live in a new world surrounded by new objects and to be animated by new hopes and desires. I loved all mankind, with no exceptions for slaveholders, though I abhorred slavery more than ever. So do you hear the convergence in Douglas's account of hope and a reorientation towards life right now? He says, I saw the world in a new light. I had new hopes, new desires. He's, he's a new person. But the outcome of that, the, the upshot of that, is that he re-engages with renewed zeal in loving his fellow human beings. And so it can be with all Christians that having this hope, having citizenship in a better kingdom, having a better home, actually can make you empowered to be an incredible neighbor, to be an incredible employee, to be an incredible employer, to be an incredible son or sister or father or nephew, whatever. This changes us in so many different ways and it pushes us out into the world to love and serve in a way that's actually more fearless and more powerful than if we thought this world was all we had. So that's the first objection. Second objection is, isn't it risky to put all your hope in a future that you've never seen? In a future that's never happened before? Isn't it risky to put all your hope in a home that you've never been to. Maybe this is an objection that your own heart has whispered to you in moments of doubt or suffering or just darkness. I know that mine has. And to this objection, there's actually an answer in our text itself. The answer, quite simply, is Christ. Jesus Christ is alive. Now, think about what that means. That means that the new creation 
that we're putting our hope in, that we're longing for, that we're organizing our whole lives around the reality of, the new creation is not exclusively future. It is largely future, but it is not exclusively future because it has already begun. When Jesus Christ walked out of the grave, the new creation started. So, yes, it is true that we are looking forward to something that we have never seen before. Yes, it is true that we are counting on something happening that is historically unprecedented. However, it is also true that this incredible future has already started. It has already broken into history. Right in the middle of history lies an empty tomb. And every human being that now hears about that has to decide what to do with that. And so a Christian is not someone who's just living their life based on a wish of like, wouldn't it be nice if the world gets better in the end? A Christian is someone who has recognized that the restoration of all things has already started. So our hope as Christians is anchored not in a wish, not in a faint desire. Our hope is anchored in a rescue mission that is already working itself out and it cannot be stopped. So, that means that you and I can face the deepest suffering, the most difficult persecutions. We can endure bouts of doubt and discouragement with a joy and a peace and a hope that from an earthly perspective makes no sense. But because we are counting on something that Jesus has already begun to do, it can give us the tenacity and the resilience to cling to Jesus through anything. Let's pray. Our Father, you have been kind to us beyond all measure, beyond any of our abilities to express or give thanks for. Your mercy has given us new life. It has given us a future. Your mercy has given us Jesus. And your mercy has secured for us a place with you, an inheritance in your kingdom. And so we pray, Father, would you guard us? Would you save and guard the people that we love and know and care about? And would you guard us through faith, not just for a time, not just for a season, but would you guard us all the way into your heavenly kingdom. We pray all this through Jesus who lives and reigns with you. Amen.